So let's look. We're going to look at three different moments in the life of Mary of Bethany. So we'll start at Luke chapter 10. Now, Luke chapter 10 is, I love this chapter. This is Jesus, the beginning of Luke 10. He's uh, uh, giving the instruction to his disciples on how to go out and make disciples, right? It's the famous, I think Luke 10, he sends out the 72. Don't take money bags. Don't take purses. You know, don't take anything with you. Go look for a person of peace, that whole deal. It's essentially we get some instruction on how to do ministry. And I love that he ends Luke chapter 10 with Jesus' visit to Bethany. So here we are. Jesus comes up to Bethany. This is before the death of Lazarus. And he's coming to visit some of his best friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Now, according to some scholars, uh, uh, Lazarus was wealthy, so he was taking care of his sisters. And Lazarus was one of Jesus' biggest supporters, biggest benefactors. So Jesus, you know, is on a fundraising trip. He's on his way. Anybody ever been in missions or ministry before? You know about those fundraising trips. <laughs> hey, man, I'm in town. What are you doing? Saturday at 2. <laughs> and so he's going to come up to Bethany to visit Jesus. I mean, to visit Lazarus. By the way, there's a very good chance that when King David flees Absalom and he's hiding out on the Mount of Olives, he is in Bethany, which is where Psalm 84 was written. Now, that's just for free. You might... <laughs> Need that in your back pocket one day. But here we are. I want to read this passage. Okay, Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Okay, so here we have Martha. You guys know this story, but I want us to really take our time looking at it. Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. But I want us to view this even from the perspective of ministry. Martha has made preparations because she wants Jesus, his presence, and she wants Jesus to come in. Sounds good, right? Yeah. Verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Or as the New King James would say, Mary would often sit at Jesus' feet and hear his word. Well, verse 40, but Martha was distracted with all her serving or all her preparations. Now, I've read this passage for many, many years. I've read it many times. And something hit me a couple of years ago, that verse 40. Martha was distracted with much serving. And just this thing hit me. And I was like, well, well, who was she serving? The Lord. And it's like this thing went off inside of me that I realized, man, this is kind of insane. She was so busy serving the Lord that she was distracted from the Lord himself. And it was like this massive like wake up moment of like, oh my God, that perfectly identifies many years of ministry that I've had, that I've been so busy serving the Lord. I've been so busy working for the Lord. I've been so busy doing the work of ministry or doing whatever it is that we do, whatever it is that we're doing, that we could have the Lord in front of us and we're too busy for him. For me, the most terrifying thing that could ever happen is to be so busy in Jesus' name that we don't got time for Jesus. Is to be so busy working for Jesus that we forget about Jesus. Now, this is what's happened in the life of, of Martha. Guys, it is possible to do so much for God that we leave God out of the equation. And so what we do then is that we have to work really hard to create a theology and a culture that mistaken busy for intimacy. And they're not the same. And here's the point. You can serve the Lord and not have relationship with him. This is terrifying as Westerners. Because if there's one thing we know how to do is work hard. Right? Like, we, we know what it's like to grind and to hit it, but now the Lord has come, and then this is the whole purpose, right? The whole purpose of this moment. They've prepared their homes for this very reason, for this very moment. This is like a lot of us, we work hard, we pray, we fast, we get the whole room ready, and the Lord comes, and we don't even notice. In fact, when the Lord comes, what do we do? We just start working harder. And we start doing more because we... Are so we, we're, we, we're afraid of that vulnerable place. 
We're afraid of friendship with God. And, and when the Lord draws near, if we're honest, for a lot of us, we start to panic. And so we got to find somebody to pray for. We got to, I got to give a prophetic word and I got to do this. And I got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. And two hours go by and you spend all your time, got to, got to, got to, and you miss the Lord. I'm terrified about this reality that in the Western church, we have so much preaching, so much worship, so much events, but I wonder how many of us are actually with the Lord. But Mary, she's at the Lord's feet. I love this. I think it's amazing to, to have your heart so dispositioned that when the Lord comes, it's like, what else do we do? We just, we just stop. And we go be with the Lord. And here's what's amazing. The person preparing the meeting was offended with the encounter. The person that prepared the room for the meeting with Jesus is going to be encountered, I mean, excuse me, offended that the very thing she was preparing for is actually happening. Could you imagine spending, imagine you, all you guys working so hard this weekend, so hard, and then the Lord comes and people stop and your heart gets hardened because the very thing you wanted actually happened, but we're more addicted to the God of serving God than God. Because it feels good to have our badges that we get to boast of in front of people. I mean, in today's economy, in today's church world, Martha's resume sounds a lot better than Mary's. Because Martha's resume would be everything she does for God. Mary's is, I sit at his feet and hear him. Today, we would take Martha over Mary to come preach at our churches. Because we've learned to value intimacy. One of the reasons we've, we've, sorry, we've, we've lost, or we, don't, we haven't learned how to value intimacy. And one of the reasons is, it's because we don't like the process that God will take us to experience intimacy. The process that God takes people to experience intimacy is always the process of dying and resurrecting. God has to kill you to get you out of the way of encountering him. We're going to go on a little journey. Let's keep reading. So Martha was distracted right, with all her preparations, with all her serving. And she came up to the Lord and said, Lord, I love this. Finally, she stops to talk to the Lord. <laughs> Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. She doesn't even let the Lord respond. She says, don't you think it's ridiculous? She's sitting here with you and there's so much work to do for you. Tell her to get up and work. I'm sure you care about that. I'm sure it matters to you. I'm sure you just, you just want us to work ourselves to death because, we're, because and what she's manifesting is she has no confidence in how the Lord feels about her. No confidence. All of her value is in everything she does for God. And if she's not doing something for God, therefore she must have no value. And she's manifesting on Jesus. And that's what we do sometimes. We have to figure out a way to, to work our way. Have you guys ever had this happen? You go a couple of days, you don't pray or, or whatever. You have a couple of rough days. And, and then now it's the first day you're going to get up to pray again. You missed a couple of days because you got busy. And you spend the whole first hour trying to convince God to like you again. Has anybody ever been here before? Raise your hand. That's not God. I mean, it's like, it's, you know what? It's the equivalent of saying, God, would you let Jesus die for me again? Because I don't think the first time was good enough. Right? We, 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 start, we get into this mode of, of, of panic and chaos and, and all of our emotions all over the place that before you know it, you're rebuking the Lord. This is exactly what Martha's doing. She's rebuking the Lord for allowing Mary to stay at his feet and not be busy and not work. This is the same thing we did in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember when man fell? 
What did we do when man fell? We hid. And then what did God come do? What did God, uh, Shandai, what did God do? He came walking in the garden. Why? Because it's what he always did. It's amazing that people have created all these theologies about why God came to the garden that day. He was coming to kick them out. He was coming back. No, that's just what God always came to walk with us, but we can't accept it. Most people in this room, you know what your biggest issue is? It's not that you love sin. It's that you don't know how to be loved by God. It's not that you're, it's not that you're a wicked person. It's that you still live as though you're naked and ashamed. So they hide behind the bush. God comes, and the Lord says, where are you, Adam? And what does Adam say? Stay away. It's the same thing we say now. God, you're too Holy for us. You know that theology, God's too holy for us? That didn't come from God. That came from fallen Adam. The whole idea that there has to be distance between us never was God's idea. It was ours. It's one of my favorite writers, a man named Abraham Joshua Heschel. He has one of my favorite sayings. He says, man distances himself from God, and then he blames God for the distance. Man distances himself from God, and then he blames God for the distance. And so now we have to create all this theology to explain why there's distance. But all you got to do is come out from hiding behind the bush. And so we create an entire theology of prove yourself to God when God never asked you to prove anything. This is amazing. Martha rebukes. Can you imagine rebuking the Lord? <laughs> like, Lord, you know this ain't right. You know she needs to do more. She's got to prove herself. We've got to prove ourselves. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. And da, 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 da. And here comes the Lord. <laughs> I, think he's, I think, what, is she like the only person the Lord called her name twice? <laughs> and I, I always want to picture those moments. And the, and the Lord said to her, Martha, Martha. And I, you know why he says Martha, Martha? And he's like, what you wanted, you got, and you can't even notice it. You spent all day, all weekend, preparing your house for me to come, and I'm here, and me being here ain't good enough for you. You find more value in what you can do with me than you find in being with me. That's the problem with a lot of us. The truth is, if we were honest, if we were really honest, and we, didn't, we had no pretension. If we were honest, what's really wrong with us is that Jesus is not enough. If we were real, the Lord just isn't enough. And because the Lord isn't enough, I've got to work really hard to mask and make up for the fact that the Lord isn't enough. So I'll drown myself in doing things in his name because he ain't enough. So the Lord says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered by many things. You're worried and troubled. Do you know what she was worried? I don't know what you're, you are. Uh, you're worried. Well, wow, good trend. It's NASB. Good job. You're worried and bothered by so many things. What was Martha worried and bothered by? Serving the Lord. I don't want you to miss that when you read the passage. She wasn't worried and bothered about cleaning the house. She was worried and bothered about proving herself to God with how much she could do for him. Because friendship with God wasn't enough for her. So she's worried and bothered by many things. And here comes one of the most profound things that will ever come out of the mouth of Jesus. And it isn't about preaching. It isn't about working miracles. It isn't about casting out demons. And it isn't even about prayer and fasting. I'm not saying not to do those things. We're commissioned to do those things. But preaching, living, talking about all those things without living in the tension of Luke 10, 42 will get you into massive trouble and burnout. See, doing great works of ministry without Luke 10, 42, you become a Matthew 7 Christian. Lord, look at, we healed the sick in your name. We packed out stadiums in your name. We mobilized thousands in your name. We healed the sick in your name. We casted out devils and the Lord will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And then he says something profound. He says, I never knew you. 
But what is he saying? He says, you never did it with me. You did it, but you didn't do it with me. Therefore, I don't want it. God would rather you live a simple life of profound intimacy than have a profound ministry with simple intimacy. But we don't know how to think that way. We only know how to think of what's bigger, badder, and sexier. Do it, don't we? We think because 50,000 people shut up, God calls it powerful. But in this text, God calls one simple girl sitting at his feet as powerful. We have graduated from the glory of just having a devotional life. We've graduated from the glory of just sitting and being with the Lord. Look at what Jesus says. He says, you're troubled by somebody in verse 42. But only one thing is necessary. This isn't my opinion, friends. Do you hear me? This isn't me saying, hey, here's what I think is really good. I read a whole bunch of books. This is the Lord. You know, the guy that bought your life? You know, the one who created the earth, that guy, the Lord, capital L, Lord, he's looking at you and he's saying, I love your ambition to preach. I love your ambition to missions. I love your ambition for church planning. I love your ambition for worship. But take it from me, one thing is necessary. In other words, here's what he's saying. If you're going to give me one thing, I'll tell you what I want. If you've got capacity for just one thing in your life, and some of you that are moms need to hear this because you're the ones that always feel so disqualified because you have no capacity for anything else, but you've got capacity for the only actual thing Jesus wants. But you still, oh, I can't do anything. I don't have time to lead worship, preach, travel. And the Lord says, that's fine. One thing is needed. In other words, if all you do is this one thing, you made the cross worth it for me. I want you to hear this. If all you do is this one thing, you made the cross worth it, but if you do everything else but the one thing, you miss the point of the cross. Yeah. Only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the good part. And it will not be taken away from her. I, I wish, if I could go back to almost any moment in the Bible, is to be in that room when the Lord says that. Imagine all the exploits, all the things that happen in the Bible. By the way, Mary is going to be a part of two times where Jesus said only one thing is needed. And whenever you tell the gospel, make sure you tell everyone what this woman did. And both times, nobody was preaching. Nobody was planning a church. Nobody was healing the sick. Nobody was casting out devils. Nobody was doing anything but just being with the Lord. I'll tell you a story. Uh, years ago, I moved to Texas. I was really busy in ministry. And one night, the Lord woke me up. I knew it was the Lord, but I still wanted to go back to bed. I said, Lord, I'll see you in a few hours. <laughs> and I went back to bed. And then the Lord woke me up again. And I was like, Lord, I'll tell it to you in Spanish. I'm going back to bed, Lord. I'm really tired. I'm, you know, because I was so busy working for him. And I had meetings and I had things to do for God. And I said, Lord, you're, you don't know, I need to sleep. I got a little busy day for you tomorrow. <laughs> the Lord woke me up again. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'll sit up in bed. Wait, wait, okay, here I am. And the Lord said, I want you to get up and I want you to go downstairs and I want you to sit at the kitchen table. So I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Literally, I'm, like, I'm about to have an encounter. <laughs> I didn't just grab any Bible. I grabbed my Thompson chain reference Bible. <laughs> I wanted it to be heavy and my notebook, and my pen, and I'm, and this is so embarrassing, but I'm like, oh, here, my ministry is about to take off. <laughs> Before God, I am thinking this, like, what is he about to tell me? Like, he's about to give me this revelation, I'm going to get caught up and, like, thrown across planets, Bob Jones is going to come visit me, like, <laughs> like, I am like, something is about to happen, because God's woken me up three times, he knows how busy I am for him. He's woken me up three times, and he wants me to get up and go downstairs and sit at the kitchen table. Literally, this is the way I thought. 
I'm about to have the defining encounter of my ministry. Hey, you laugh, that's how a lot of us think. Because Jesus ain't enough. God forbid that the Lord would have an encounter with us for his own sake and not for any other reason. So I come downstairs and I sit at my kitchen table. I got my notebook and I'm like, here we go. Oh, here we go. Sit Roth, here I come. <laughs> And I said, all right, God, whoo, I've been waiting for this moment. I'm glad my website's up because I'm about to get booked. <laughs> and I said, Lord, what do you want? And the Lord said, I don't want anything. You don't want anything? Well, what are you going to tell me? And I said, I don't, don't want to tell you anything. What do you, what do you want me to read? And I, the Lord said, don't read anything. What do you want me to pray? I, and I, the Lord said, I didn't wake you up to pray. He said, he said, I don't want anything from you. You've just been so busy lately. I just missed you. Just sit here with me for a little bit. Could you imagine the Lord having to work hard to find time in your schedule to spend time with you? Oh, Martha, Martha. You're worried and bothered by so many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part and it will not be taken away from her. Let's go to John chapter 11. Are you guys good? Yeah. I have no idea what time I started. I'm just going to go till I'm done. Are we good? Yeah. I've got till 5 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. <laughs> well, John 11, we're going to do a little different. I'm just going to tell it to you like a story. Is that cool? Yeah. Not... Dana, my wife and I, uh, uh, we host these songwriting retreats, and it was the first one we ever did, and we wrote a song, and so I'm going to use Creative Liberty, <laughs> and we said, we wrote the song about, me. well, I didn't write it, Dana did, but I was just in the room talking, and, <laughs> and we're like, what if, you know, Mary's at his feet, what if, what if Mary got up one day, what if, what if, like all of us sometimes, what if she just got distracted? What if she got bored? And I always love telling this to young people. You know, to be quite honest, walking with God is mostly boring. No, I'm just being honest. Getting up every day to pray mostly is boring. And you mostly wonder, what are you doing? And I'm mostly trying not to think about the Philadelphia Phillies. <laughs> Most of the time I'm like, I rebuke that. I will not think about the Eagles. I will not think about the Eagles. I will not think about the Eagles. But then I'm like, Literally, I'll be like, but Jalen Hurts. And I, I just, I go off for like 10 minutes. Like most of the time, it's boring. Most of the time, I read my Bible, and I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I am probably, my ministry's done. I don't know. I just sit there, or I fall asleep. Right? Let's just be honest. Like, walk, like there's like, in 40 years, five times God shows up. The rest of the time, you're just trying to stay awake. Or, you know? You're just trying, you're like praying in tongues, and then, you know, every couple of years, you're like, I wonder if I'm really baptized in the Spirit. <laughs> Anybody ever been there before? Come on. Don't lie. You go to hell, the book of Revelation says. If you guys know that, you're like, -da 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 -da. God, am I really baptized in the Spirit? What if I faked it? What if I've been faking it this whole time? Oh, my God. What if I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What if my whole ministry is a fraud? I'm going to be on Julie Royce. Oh, my God. You know what I'm saying? You go through this internal crisis, and then you're like, okay, well, just in case, God baptized me in the Holy Spirit, baptized me in the Holy Spirit, baptized me in the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to blaspheme it if you really did, so just do it again. If it's the first time or the second time, I don't know which one, just do it. I'm done. I don't want to pray anymore. I'm just going to go watch YouTube. That's what it's mostly like. No, that's, that's reality. You call it boring. God calls it worth it. That, I mean, that's the truth. That's what, like that's, you know, everybody's like, I want to be on fire for the Lord. Good luck. On fire is mostly boring mornings and late nights of not trying to fall asleep and trying to understand Habakkuk, yeah. trying to pronounce it right. Like, you know, how many of y'all spent your whole, you're going to read a whole new book. You spend the whole first hour trying to figure out how to pronounce his name. I meet these people. Oh, I read the word for now. What'd you do? Man, I did all this research on the city he was from. 
No, you mean you got lost on YouTube. <laughs> but you got all this. But you, you meet those people. I'm doing all study in Isaiah. Week one, they're like, I got all this information. Week two, they're like, I never heard of Isaiah. <laughs> You're like Peter at the campfire. I never heard of him. I don't know the man. <laughs> but that's reality. That's why it's called faithfulness. It's just years of overcoming boredom. But see, this is the whole point. See, this is what we've missed. We don't have a life of devotion for our sake. See, this is where we've twisted it in the West. The reason most of us give up on God is because we have mistaken that the cross is all about us. We've made devotional life, or the reason we give up on intimacy, the reason we give up on seeking God is because it doesn't do it for me. That's the point. It's never been about you. It's always been about the Lord. The whole reason we do what we do is because God loves it. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. The Lord loves it. See, if we would just catch the revelation. That getting up in the morning was more about God getting what he wanted than us getting what we wanted. You'd get up every morning. And I, just, I remember when this revelation hit me. You know what? Here's what's amazing. Do you know that it's just, I, I, it blows my mind for thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years before God ever created the universe, he had the worship of the angels. It's amazing. And at some point, God told God, this don't quite cut it. Just think about that. You exist because the worship of the angels didn't satisfy him. That's why you're alive. If the worship of the angels was enough, there'd be no earth and there'd be no human beings. I don't know how it works, to be quite honest. And sometimes I want to be careful when I think about these things, but I like to think about them. The, the, the sustaining factor of the whole earth is God talking to God. <laughs> Literally. That's the whole premise of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And he upholds the, the world, the cosmos, by the word of his power. Not by his powerful word, by the word of his power. The way God demonstrates power is by words. And the word is God talking to God. The, the, literally, God manifests power through dialogue. And for... Thousands upon thousands, I don't know, since, since God. God has been talking to God about God. And then there's angels, and they're worshiping. And somewhere in that conversation, and I know I'm treading carefully on water here, but somewhere in that conversation, God reveals to God some measure of longing for another. Just think about that. The next time you think you're worthless, you're alive because myriads of myriads of myriads of angels didn't cut it. This is why Jesus didn't die for the 2,000 fallen angels. He died for you and I. The reason he died for you and I is because we were created as the only beings in the created order that have the ability to satisfy God. Just think about that. There's no other being in the created order that can do what we do to God. In your weakness, in your brokenness, in your up and down patterns, in your boredom, in your distraction, in your discouragement, in the mundane moments of your life, 10 minutes, one hour of boring prayer does more for God than 10,000 years of unending for living creature worship. Because we're the only being that God deposited a part of himself into. We don't get up to pray in the morning because it benefits us. We get up to pray in the morning because it's what God loves. And when we can get the mindset off of how I feel and how it makes God feel, you'll make it to the end. So we started talking, like, what if Mary got up 
What if Mary got distracted? What if Mary got bored? Like, like it happens to all of us. What if life got in the way? What would the Lord have done to get Mary back? It's John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is a very complicated passage, a very complicated chapter in the Bible, especially if you're charismatic and you believe that God always only heals. Because what I found out is God does not always only heal. Unless you believe in a resurrection, then he always does. But that's another conversation for another time. So here's what happens. John chapter 11. Lazarus is sick. And so Mary and Martha send a couple of friends down to Jesus who is south of Jerusalem towards the Galilee. And uh, they're going to come tell him that Lazarus is sick. And they want Lazarus to be healed. So they come to Jesus. The Lord of glory, who they've seen do miracles and heal the sick and, and multiply food, all this stuff. These guys are full-on charismatics. You might even say they're Pentecostal. <laughs> they've been known to shout a time or two. And they believe in this stuff. So they come to the Lord. Not only do they believe it, they've seen the Lord do it. So they come to the Lord, and it says, Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. This is a done deal. They're not only have they come to the Lord, they know how to pray. Lazarus, whom you love, open parentheses, your biggest financial supporter, close parentheses. <laughs> open parentheses, you know you really love his sister Mary, she's like a faithful follower, close parentheses. Is sick. This is, this is like done deal, right? The Bible says that the, Jesus loving them doesn't go. Can you imagine that moment when the Lord says, I'm not coming. They're probably like, oh, are you going to do that thing when you're going to say, it'll be done according to your faith. We're going to get back. They're like, he's healed. They're like, what time? Well, it's the same time he said it. And the Lord's like, no, 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 no. Uh, no, no. I'm not coming because I'm not going to heal Lazarus. I, 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 I never forget I went through a season in college of so much pain and turmoil and coming to this chapter and realizing maybe this pain isn't the enemy. Maybe it's God. Those moments of your life when God is supposed to show up and it's not just that he doesn't. It's that he chooses not to. We don't talk about that in church very much. And I want to be a person of faith. And I want to be a person that believes God in all times. But sometimes, actually all the time, but the way it manifests is different. God is more committed to glory than he is to comfort. And the glory of God is not what we oftentimes think it is. The Lord says, I'm not coming. I'm staying right here. I am not going to heal Lazarus, could you imagine contending for your marriage is falling apart and the Lord says, I'm not going to heal it. This is the equivalent. I don't want you to lose the severity or you're contending for your husband to be healed or your wife or your, or your child or sick with cancer or whatever it is. And the Lord says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not coming. I always, for years, I've thought about it. The last 12 years of my life, what was that journey back to Bethany like for those two guys? They're the first people in the New Testament to deal with disappointment from God while he's still alive and on the earth. God has disappointed them by choice. And then they have to go tell Mary and Martha. I've thought of it for 12 years of my life. I've thought about it. And you have to go look at Mary and Martha and say, and they're like, where's the Lord? Where's Jesus? And to say, he's not coming. What do you mean he's not coming? He said he's not coming. If he doesn't come, Lazarus is going to die. Did you tell them? Did you tell him that he's sick? Did you tell him he's at the point of death? Did, does he understand? No, we told him. We told him everything. He's still not going to come. He said, he said he's not coming. He said he's not 
going to heal Lazarus. And then Lazarus dies. I've thought about this a lot. See, all of us have faith for things to be healed. Very little of us actually have faith for things to be resurrected. I think part of it is because we always love the easy way out of things. I mean, honest, I, I, I've come to this conclusion. Sometimes God's a lot more brutal than we think. We think, oh, there's the New Testament God and the Old Testament God. I don't know. This might be the most brutal thing God's ever done in the whole Bible. That's just is my opinion. It's just something so, when you realize that God is bigger and cannot be controlled more than you realize. And then comes a moment when the Lord says to the disciples, all right, it's time to go to Bethany. We've got to wake Lazarus up. It's been a week or so. We've got to wake Lazarus up. And the disciples, and you guys know the story, they don't want to go up there because they're afraid to go through Jerusalem because they're going to get killed. And Jesus says, well, we got to wake him up. And then they go very snarky. Well, if he's asleep, he'll wake himself up. And then Jesus says one of the most harsh statements. He says this, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes. Now you'll see the glory of God. Could you imagine if your marriage fell apart, and the Lord looked at you and said, your marriage fell apart, and I'm glad for your sake. Put yourself in the story. Have you ever believed for something that didn't work out the way it was supposed to, and the one thing God says for you is, it didn't work out, and I'm glad for you. Because now you're going to see the glory of God. How would that make you feel? How would you feel about glory then? I'm sure you're not going to be shouting and jumping and, and, and putting on your favorite worship song. I'm sure you'd be greatly offended with God. You know, if we were honest, there's probably a lot of people in this room that have unforgiveness towards the Lord. Because he didn't come the way that he, he, they, he didn't come the way you wanted him to. What a statement from Jesus, our sweet little lamb. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes. Could you imagine going through pain and turmoil and agony and everything falling apart? And all God's got to say is, well, I'm happy for you. One of the reasons I'm preaching this message it's because I've just come out of the most painful year of my life. It's probably the second time I've talked about it publicly. The most painful year of my life. And it has been excruciating, excruciating year. Uh, uh, my, my family and I, we'd moved to Alabama last year. And uh, an hour into the drive, I got a phone call from the board of directors, uh, the director of the board that I, of the ministry that I work for, to notify me that the founder of our organization had just confessed or had just got caught having a three-year-long affair and had been lying. And the person he was having an affair with was the person that I worked with leading my department. For three years, he was having this affair and lying. And I'm an hour into this move, and I'm like, oh, my God. I get off the phone, and I do what I call him to confront him. And I said, I heard that so-and-so called me, told me they were having an affair. He hangs up on me and responds to me with a message saying, you sign an NDA, because we work in the Middle East. If you say anything, I'll sue you, and I'll take you to court. And immediately, this guy goes from being from one of my best friends to not only have I found out he's been living a lie for three years, is threatening to sue me and to sue the entire board and to sue the entire ministry. And then we find out that not only has he done that, he's stolen $500,000 from the organization. And we begin this several month long process of discovering what was really happening. And, and it's this back and forth conversation of all these things that are happening. And so we come to this moment. I'm just gonna be raw with you guys. Is that good? I come to this moment where we have to make a decision. What are we going to do? We're done. It's been back and forth. He's threatening to sue. He's, he's stolen all this money. This guy goes from being one of your best friends to telling you he'll destroy you, essentially. He 
he goes to one of our other friends who's a, who's a well-known speaker and says, if, if, if you do anything, if anybody finds out, because these guys have been friends for 15 years, you know what you do with friends for 15 years? You confess sin to one another. He said, I'll take every sin you've ever confessed and I'll publicize it to the whole world. So I'm, I'm just in like, just moved across the country, unpacking and having these long phone calls, crushed about what's happening. So me and my buddy, we say, well, we need wisdom on what to do. So I said, I know who to call. I'll call my spiritual father, and I'll get wisdom. So I call a man named Mike Bickle. He's the founder of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. And some of you might have heard of him or might not have heard of him. And I call Mike, and and because and, at that time, I said, there's no other leader on the earth that I trust more than Mike. How many of you have heard of Mike? Just curious. Anybody here? I was the president of, the, of Mike's personal ministry board until last year, until November of last year. So I call Mike. So what do we do? How do we handle this? How do we, how do, and, and his advice was, sweep it under the rug. Don't do anything. It's not what we wanted to do. But I said, well, there's no leader on this earth that I trust more than this man. He's the most righteous leader I've ever met. He's got more integrity than anyone I've ever met. Doesn't make sense to me, but I'll do it. Then comes two months later, on a Wednesday, October 25th. I'll never forget this. As long as I live for the rest of my life, at 9 a.m., my, my friend Joel sends me a message and says, hey, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. He's like, and so we get on the phone. Uh, I was driving to Ramp U to teach a class. And he says, I'll, for the rest of my life, I will never forget this phone call. He says, I have to tell you something that's going to change your life. I have to drop a bomb, and it's going to be an atomic bomb. So I'm thinking, man, uh, uh, my friend has sued us. This is it. I'm about to get sued, which I'm like, whatever. He's going to take my Volkswagen Jetta. <laughs> <laughs> I just want my family. Well, he takes my Jetta. Oh, I'll finally get a pickup truck. <laughs> I didn't think he was about to tell me what he was about to tell me. What he tells me is that, that several women had come forward, and, and they had found out that Mike Bickle, for the last 40 years, had been sexually abusing women. And begins to tell me all these things that were coming out. And I'll never forget that moment as I'm sitting in the driveway of my house, slowly putting my car into reverse. And, and it, it, it was the equivalent of somebody saying, your father just died. Because in that one moment, everything that I understood, like in that moment, everything I understood, all my perception, I mean, everything just imploded. In a matter of six months, I lost one of my best friends who was the founder of the ministry that I worked for and found out that the guy that I viewed as my spiritual father had been a predator for 40 years. I'll never forget that moment. I start driving to the school, and I've got sunglasses on. I don't like crying in public, and, and I know that I'm about, to, I'm about to come unglued. I'm about to explode. So my buddy Josh, I'm on his way to, to go to his office, and I'm like, I, I said, I said, Joel, I gotta call you back. I'm about to get to the school, and I'm about, to, I can't, like I'm about to lose it. And I'm like, I just got to get to his office. And all, everything in me, it's like all the found, everything was just, it's like all the way I could spend, it's like just feeling like you're just like free falling. It might sound ridiculous, but it's how I felt. And I get into his office, and I lose it, crying. I just lose it. And I don't cry, so he thinks something's happened to Dana and the kids because I can't say it. I could not bring myself to say it. And I have to tell him what I was just told. And that day began one of the most, one of the longest gut-wrenching days as I'm calling friends and leaders for, and spending hours on the phone hearing information of what, what has been happening for the last 40 years, months before most of the public would know most of this stuff. All the while, I'm the president of his board. And go through the next few months of my whole world collapsing. I mean, I'll be honest, there were times I didn't handle it very well. Just anger inside of me. And deep depression. Because Mike wasn't just some leader that I looked at and watched. I mean, I, when, when the leader of our organization fell... My wife looked at me and she said, thank God, at least we have Mike. At least there's Mike. And having that, 
everything inside of me of trying to understand what's real, what's not real. Is this whole thing a lie? Is Jesus a lie? Is what, like what? And, and having that, if the guy that sat in a room for 12 hours a day, for f- six days a week, for 40 years, if he can't make it, I don't have a, I might as well quit. There's no hope. And all and our different friends and heroes, one by one, finding out all of these things, and everything is collapsing. And it's months of just excruciatingly painful phone calls. And everything you've ever held on to, theology, doctrine, you've believed in with your whole heart, seemingly being ripped apart from you, piece by piece. Every day, just worse and worse. And you find out about this, and then this person comes forward, and this person comes forward. And every day, you're like, God, I just, I can't take it anymore. And I would get to moments where I'd be like, I just want to quit. I want to quit everything. I want to disappear. I want to hide from everyone. And you go, God, why would you let me get so close to this man? Why would you do that? Do you know that I was in Kansas City? I flew out on Sunday, October 9th, Monday, October 10th. The, the husband of Jane Doe came to confront Mike for the first time. I was there the last normal weekend of Mike's ministry. No idea what was about to happen. No idea what was about to unfold. And I began to get mad at God. You tricked me. I feel like a fool. I started saying, oh, you did this. You let me. I, I, my, I, my wife and I, we'd go to his house and drive. Like, you put me at risk. Like, you did this. My reputation, everything. In one year. And I would get it. This is your fault. Why would you do this, God? Why would you let me get lied to and use and, 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 and uh, you know, stuff that was happening with the board? I didn't know it was happening. To hear the Lord essentially say, well, your whole world has died, and I'm glad for your sake. Because now you can see the glory of God. Your whole world has crumbled, Jose. Now you've got nothing left, but you have me. Everything you ever held on to, the voices that you, you held on to dearly. It felt good to have a guy that's read the Bible 12 hours a day, six days a week for 40 years, a phone call away. And the Lord, I never forget that moment. I, I, it's like all of a sudden I rediscovered the book of Psalms. And I rediscovered the Lord. I was so angry because I was convinced I lost everything. And I realized that was the problem. That the Lord stopped being everything. And you get to, and you, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're processing and rationalizing all these things to just realize, God, you did lead me to Mike. And you did lead me to pastorize. And you did lead me to Rick. And you led me to all these things. So you could bring me to my, the end of myself. And just find, you, find your feet again. Jesus comes to Bethany. To the funeral of Lazarus. We're back to John 11. He comes to the funeral of Lazarus. Are you guys good if we go just a little bit longer? Yes. Are you guys good? Yes. He comes to the funeral. Can you imagine when the Lord walks to him to the funeral? That's what I felt like, sitting in my own little funeral, and God didn't come to feel sorry for me. He shows up to the funeral, and there comes Martha. And and again, you know, you read it, if you had only been here, do you think it sounded like that? It probably sounded a lot more like this. If you had only been here, this whole thing is your fault. Who do you think you are showing up here now? See, the reason most of you can't worship because you've never been honest with God about how you feel. You've worked so hard trying to keep it together to prove yourself to God, and he knows exactly what's happening inside of you. Martha says, if this is your fault, if only you'd been here. And Jesus says, I doesn't even acknowledge. He says, what, do you believe your brother's going to live again? And she says, well, yes. He gives, you know, one day, 
at the resurrection. She does, she, she does, she does what busy people do. You just give the, you give the right answer, but it's not the real answer. You know the script. You know the doctrine, but you don't know the man. She says, yeah, of course, yeah, one day. And he says, no, I am the resurrection. Hallelujah. And she leaves. <laughs> and she says, Mary, the Lord's here. <laughs> I always think, could you imagine the Lord's like, oh, I am the resurrection. And she's like, okay. <laughs> and she goes, Jesus wants to see you. <laughs> he ain't happy. This is my opinion. This whole thing was for what was about to happen. This wasn't about Lazarus. This, is a, this, is, this hasn't been about Mike. I mean, that's massive. At least for me. This whole moment was for what was about to happen. And Mary comes, and she sees the Lord. And what does she do when she sees the Lord? She falls at his feet. In that moment, she remembered the Lord. And at his feet, she says, Lord, if you be. It's not until Mary falls at his feet that Jesus weeps. It says, and Mary fell at his feet. And then the next part, and Jesus wept. And it hit me. I don't think he wept because Lazarus was dead. I think he wept because he missed Mary. The Lord knew he, he's the Lord. He told them he was coming to resurrect Lazarus. He wasn't mourning Lazarus. He was missing Mary. The Lord was just missing his friend. And when she saw him and fell at his feet, he began to weep. And then he said, where have you laid him? Isn't it amazing? It's when the Lord when you don't need him to do anything, it's often the times he loves moving the most. She doesn't say, will you resurrect him? And she didn't even ask for it. And he goes, where have you laid him? You know the story, they roll away the stone. Lazarus resurrects. I believe that whole thing was about John chapter two. What happens in John 12? Jesus is going to come to the house of Mary of Bethany one last time. Because a couple of days later, he's going up on a cross. He comes to the house of Mary of Bethany. Lazarus is resurrected. Everybody's there. All these leaders, the disciples are there. And he comes into the room and he sits down. One of the most profound moments in recorded history happens. This is what's amazing. He's in a room with some of the greatest leaders of his day and nobody knows how much he's worth. Except for one person. It's those that learn to suffer with him that know him the most. I was, this phrase just kept coming to me even as I was thinking about this trip a few weeks ago. I was mowing the lawn. The God of revival is the man of sorrow. The man of sorrows. And the Lord just began to tell me, I'm just looking for someone to be friends with the man of sorrows. Because everyone else loves him. It's, it's, it's the people that know how to fellowship with the man of sorrows that get his heart. This is what made David, David. You don't write Psalm 22, I am a worm and not a man. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Unless you are willing to go down with the man of sorrows. We love the God of the breakthrough, but we don't love the man of sorrows. Jesus comes into the room and he sits down and everyone's doing what they do, business as usual, except for one little girl. She comes crawling in. She's like, how dare I walk into the room? The entire posture of her life has changed. She comes crawling in with a jar of perfume. That jar, according to some scholars, would cost today Let's see, in, in, in pounds, about 130,000 pounds. See, what they would do in those days, young girls, their family, they would buy these very, very, very expensive perfumes. And these perfumes 
uh, uh, usually it was your own scent, and you saved it your whole life until you got married. When you got married, he would put it on, and it was your scent so that you could walk in any place, and your husband knew that you were there because he could smell your scent. This is what this perfume is. This girl has, has this 130,000 pound jar of perfume waiting for the moment that this man that she's dreaming of would come, sweep her off her feet, they'd get married, and she would wear this perfume for him for the rest of her life. But something changed inside of Mary, and she realized this perfume, it's never been about me. Imagine having something so expensive it should last you your whole life and you waste it in one moment. She comes into the room, crawling on the floor. She breaks open the perfume jar and she begins to anoint Jesus. And they get offended with her. Do you remember what Judah said? What a waste. We could have sold that. You know you're in bad shape when you call perfect and powerful worship moments a waste because you couldn't stream it. Or you couldn't sell it. Or you couldn't shrink wrap it. You know you're you know we're in bad shape when worship not being commodified is considered a waste. What a waste. We could have sold that. We could have prospered off of it. We could have made money. We could have done great ministry with it. Jesus says, the poor you'll have with you always. What she's done, she did it for me. She's prepared me for my burial. This is what's happened. You can get to a place when it's for the Lord, it's not worth it. What a waste. What she's done, she did it for me. She's prepared me for my burial. So here's the thing you don't understand, and I'm about to finish. The perfume that they would use in that day, it was unlike anything we have today. It, was, it would go deep into your pores. When Mary poured out that oil, Jesus smelled like that perfume for the last few days of his life. That perfume went deep inside of his pores. It covered his entire body. It covered his hair deep inside. The next day after that meal... He gets up and he gets on a donkey and he begins to ride down the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. And as he's riding down the hill and the wind is hitting his body and his pores are open, do you know what that crowd smells? Mary's worship. When he goes up to the temple and he makes a, a whip and he begins to whip the tables and, and the wind is blowing through him, do you know what all those people smell as he's whipping the table and flipping tables? Mary's worship. When he goes into the Last Supper and he sits down on the table, you know what fragrance begins to fill the room? Mary's worship. When he tells them he's going to be crucified and John leans in, do you know what? All he could smell is that girl's jar of perfume. When he gets up and he goes to the Garden of Eden to pray and he's so filled with the intensity of the moment that his pores open up to the place. Blood is dripping out of his body. Do you know what that garden smelled like? Mary's worship. When Judas Iscariot comes with the guard from the chief priest to betray Jesus, and he comes up and he kisses him in the cheek, and he says, Hell, Rabbi, all he could smell was the worship that he called the waste. When they lead Jesus to Caiaphas' house, and they blindfold them, and every man that would come and slap him, every time they would hit him, they would open up his pores. Caiaphas' house began to smell like Mary's oil. They lead him to Pontius Pilate. And as he stands before Pontius Pilate, and Pilate begins to ask him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, it is as you say, all Pilate can smell is Mary's worship. When they take him down to the praetorium, and they tie his hands, and they take out a cat of nine tails, whips with shards of glass and broken bone, and every time they hit his body, every strike was like diffusing the oil of Mary's adoration. 
after they beat him and they put the crown of thorns and they commissioned him to carry the cross to Calvary. And because of exhaustion and fatigue, he can't do it anymore. They find a man named Siren the Cyrene. And they say, carry it with him. And as he's carrying the cross and Jesus barely holding on, is leaning on this man, all he can smell is that oil penetrating from the broken body of Jesus. When they get to Calvary and they lay his body down naked, without a loincloth, completely naked, his head would have swollen up two or three times the normal size because that's what happens if you pierce the, the part of the, the head with the crown of thorns and his bodies disfigured. Isaiah said when they looked at him, they didn't recognize a man. He looked like an animal. As those men were nailing his, dead, his, his body to the cross to die, all they could smell was that girl's jar of perfume. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, struggling to take a breath. That's the whole point of crucifixion, as you suffocate. What comforts him? He said, in the darkest hour of his life, he at least had one friend that chose the good part. He had one friend. Everyone else was so busy with their ministry and their this and their that and running around. Just at least one person noticed him. At least one friend was willing to fellowship with him in his sufferings. I'm convinced that the death of Lazarus was to awaken Mary to anoint him at Bethany. 